to the founders Father, that they are the destroyed, 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 completely perfected, 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 so God, the Lord of the world, supreme God, we human beings to be tamed, to Jesus, the God, human beings to you, the complete and fully awakened one, the endowed and standard dispute, the glorious conqueror, the subdued from the Shakya claim, I prostrate, make offering, and go for refuge. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy with respect, bowing in bodies as many as all realms, Adam, in all expect, with their supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous action, perform all the perfect virtuous actions, subdue your mind truly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew, or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud, sick condition, things as such. Through this merit, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the four of faults, and be delivered from samsaric ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I prostrate to the Aradiva Jain, thus did I hear one time the Bhagavan of dwelling with a mass of vultures mountain in Rasgaya, together with that community of monks and great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories, phenomena of profound perception. Also, at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Lakishora looked upon the very practice of profound perfection and wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shari Putra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Lakishora How should any son of the lineage train who wish to practice the activities of profound perfection and wisdom? He said that in the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Lakishora said this to the Venerable Shari Tidhi Putra. Shari Buddha, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activities of profound perfection or wisdom, should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty or in hidden nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling discrimination, composition of that term, consciousness are empty. Shari Buddha likewise often. Phenomena of emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shari Buddha, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compulsional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no order, no test, no object of touch, no phenomena. There is no I element and so on up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on. Up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and the There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and also no non-attainment. Shari Buddha, therefore, because there is no attainment, both subtles rely on joy and perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond the era, they reached it in point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awakened on unsurprisable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that truly pacify all suffering should be known as truth since it's not false. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is declared, Tata Om Gade Gade Paragade Parasam Gade Bodhe Soha. Shari Buddha, the Bosatva Master, but should train in a profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commanded the Bosatva Master, but Ali of Lokishora, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as if it indicated, even that other goddess rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadi Titi Putra, uh, the Bhusada Master, the Arya Loki Shora, those surrounding the entirely alone with the walls of the gods, humans, Asura, and Gandhavas, are overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. Sajibhe <laughs> 
For refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Essence. By the merits I create through listening to the Dhamma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentients. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, we have been discussing um, middle lumbering and we are in a section where um, the discussion of true truths and um, again the, uh, the understanding of true truth is correctly understanding is crucial in order to have um, the, the basis the true truth in order to have the path and the, the method and the wisdom and so through the path of wisdom method, then we can achieve the two Buddhas, the Dhammakaya and uh, Rubakaya. And through that, uh, how we can help and benefit other sentient beings through the form, uh, Rubakaya form, uh, according to the manifesting, according to the need of different individuals, according to their karma, uh, their predispositions. So, uh, and last week we kind of discussed a little bit about you know how all um, yeah um, yeah all all the phenomena has two two um, how the two all of them have uh, two two um, reality or truth uh, you know each of them has both relative and conventional reality. Mm. And we talk a little bit about the conventional reality and uh, also what does truth mean when we talk conventional truth? Uh, where does that truth refer to? So we, we kind of just finish that. Um, so in terms of those who have the uh, PDF, you know, I think those who have the book, I think Bob has uh, shared the page 383 and those who have the PDF, it is um, 260. Um, and it is at the very, big, very beginning of that page, definition of conventional truth. I think that is where we are. Um, so again, here it, it also says, you know, every external um, things or phenomena as well as internal things and phenomena, they all have two, two truths. Each of them have both conventional and related truth. And the understanding of those truth, uh, to give here one um, example is given here is, you know, um, with a sprout, very classical example. <laughs> Uh, that you find in a lot of um, uh, Buddhist scriptures. Um, sprout, for example, sprout have both ultimate reality or truth and conventional reality and truth. The nature of the sprout that, it, that is being um, found by the reasoning mind, the reasoning mind um, that relies the the emptiness, that is the, the ultimate truth. And the nature of the sprout that is found by conventional um, mind um, or conventional consciousness that you know um, comprehend deceptive objects or the false object knowledge, that is the um, um, relative truth or conventional truth. Um, and so, mm, 
And so then again, same thing in the middle way, it says in the true entity or true truth of all things are apprehended by seeing what is real and what is false. So, you know, real here um, with the reasoning, the object of seeing of real, you know, or the object of seeing um, by the reasoning consciousness that perceive the emptiness directly. Those are taught to be suchness or ultimate truth. And objects seen that are false. So the objects, you know, um, those are been seen by um, the conventional, uh, conventional consciousness or mind as a false. Uh, not as a false, but um, the object which are the false or deceptive are the conventional truth. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I always, let's see, I'm speaking here. I always find that these discussions are very confusing because there's, uh -huh. so, there's so many false, false, different types of truth and false that are flying around that it, you almost need a scorecard to keep track of them all. Because, you know, conventionally, you know, we can talk about true or false things because they are, um, you know, like, like if, if I have this cup in front of me, I can say it's true that this cup is in existence and it's in front of me, but I can say that, you know, there isn't a pyramid. So we have conventional truth and falsity. And, um, the other thing, too, that's very confusing is that in the West, we always talk about truth and falsity with respect to statements or beliefs or propositions. You know, if you go into any philosophy course, they ask you, well, what, what is it true? And they will say, well, is it they'll talk about whether statements are true or false. We never talk about objects being true or false. That seems to be something that comes from the Eastern philosophy. And for me, as I understand it, a true object really is synonymous with just an existent object. Something that actually exists seems to be the Eastern way of understanding truth and falsity. Uh, but even here, it's even more disconcerting because we're talking about a false object of knowledge. And as I understand it, an object of all knowledge means an existence, yet false seems to apply a non-existence so at the same time, we're talking about an object that both exists and non-exists. And I think, you know, what it means is there's different types of existence that's being applied. And so I think that in here, falsity and truth only apply to whether an object is inherently existent or not. But anyway, it's very confusing because we're using all this different terminology that seems mm -hmm. very different from Western terminology. And it also seems to be, um, you know, you know, wh what are you talking about? So maybe if you can explain what it means by a, you know, a false object or a true object, or, um, you know, maybe give examples of these things, you know, like if I'm holding my cup, is that a true or false object? And mm -hmm. I think you might say it's conventionally true, but ultimately false for, or something like, you know, anyway, if you could explain that a little bit, I think that would be helpful in understanding what the text means? I think uh, in uh, Eastern philosophy, in Buddhism, they use many terms for same objects, false objects, deceptive objects, conventional objects. And with that, with, by using different terms, you have better understanding of that objects. Because with each term, it gives a different description of the same objects. And so I think that is why they are using so many different terms for same objects. Even in that, you know, deceptive objects, false objects, and conventional objects. But actually they are referring to the same objects. Same thing, but because when you understand with each different term, I think we have a better understanding what that object is. So um, here, when we say um, true, the 
true or false objects. It just means that whether the object, the way object exists and the object appear to the conscious and that perceive it directly, whether it, it is it, whether there's a disparity between them or not. If the object and the mind that perceive that directly, if there is no disparity, then it becomes true object because it exists the way it appear to the mind that perceive that object. Whereas if the objects um, exist differently, but it appear differently to the mind that perceive it directly, then it is known as false or deceptive because there's a disparity between the appearance and the mode of existence. And so I think, um, I think, so if we understand the meaning of what false or truth in that sense, maybe um, then maybe we might have a different understanding of how maybe it might have used the term truth in, a, in the Western, how it might have used differently. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I also find too that it seems a little bit, for me, we talk about a true object, but you just said that whether it is a true object depends on the consciousness observing it. So when we say true object, we seem to throw truth onto the object itself, whereas in this case, it also depends on the, on the consciousness that's observing it, whether it sees it, uh, whether the appearance is the, the actual way it exists or not. Mm -hmm. mm. So basically, another way of um, footing it is the object that has been perceived directly by conventional consciousness is a conventional truth. An object that has been perceived directly by the uh, consciousness that apprehend the ultimate truth or emptiness directly, that is ultimate truth. So even though there are so many words, sometimes it becomes more confusing because uh, uh, false, deceptive, and this knowledge, it becomes very long, but I think if you put it more simple way, um, that is, that is, is, you know, um, the object can be perceived by two different minds, two different type of mind, one conventional consciousness or mind, and what is mind that relies the ultimate truth directly. And so the object that is been perceived or apprehended by the uh, the uh, the mind that perceives ultimate truth that is the that object become ultimate truth or or reality and then um, the object that is a perceiving perceived at conventional um, uh, mind or consciousness directly is a, a conventional truth or reality so I think that is um, and I think I already mentioned why it is called false or deceptive, you know, because there's a deception of false in the appearance and the way it exists, you know. Mm. Because in terms of ultimate truth, the emptiness, for example, emptiness, when it appears to the, the consciousness that perceives emptiness directly, to that mind, it does not appear in hidden existence. Okay. Emptiness, when it appears to the mind that precedes emptiness directly, to that mind, the emptiness doesn't appear inherently. So, so emptiness, but it, it doesn't appear inherently, but it appears non inherently existence. So to the, that mind that perceived directly, it appeared non internal existence and it in the mode of existence is also non internal existence. So there's no disparity between the appearance and the way it exists, the mode of existence. Yeah, are, are we clear? Whereas conventional phenomena, the, to the mind that perceived them directly, those conventional phenomena appear as inherently existent to that mind that perceived them. And so even though it appear inherently existent to the consciousness that perceived them directly, but the way they exist is non inherently existent. So there's a disparity. So therefore it becomes false and deceptive. 
so that is why uh, so i think that is that that just a um, little bit on that um and again maybe if i give a little bit of example again why true understanding true reality truth of important is so that we don't get um, misled by the appearance by the appearance um, you know because we know even though there is a certain appearance but there, there is something another reality beyond that, that appearance that appearance is a conventional reality but beyond that conventional reality there is ultimate truth ultimate reality and so they are so then we don't get deceived by the just the appearance um if we give you one example maybe if, if it helps you know for example a person a person's um the nature of the person could have two different nature okay persons one per that same person okay the persons is very compassionate very kind caring nature okay that is one nature but also he or she has that nature he or she can be very easily um temperament you know if you kind of push the burden they can be very temporarily um, temperament easily temperament so he or sh she has two kind of nature you know one is very kind compassion caring on the other hand easily temperamental if you understand both of those nature you don't get deceived because even though he or she is compassionate, you know he or she can be very has that temperament nature. So you have to be more cautious, more aware, more careful, not to push push the button. But if you don't understand those two natures, you only see the appearance because he's loving, compassion, caring. Then you know you don't know that other nature, and then without knowing, you might be kind of pushing the burden, and then you might be upsetting that person upsetting yourself as well so there are two different nature you know one and so understanding both nature help us uh, to interact connect better and uh, um, without being so much deceptive you know uh, falling in the deceptions and so same way that is where it is um, uh, So here, we when we talk false, um, you know, uh, false objects, um, and it is called false. Yeah, okay, maybe. And so then, next one, uh, where is C? It says it is necessary to acquire the mind of view in order a certain basic as conventional truth. Um, In order to understand any object as a conventional truth, any object as a deceptive object, as a false object, first you have to understand the emptiness of that object. If you don't understand the emptiness of that object, then you wouldn't understand that it is a deceptive. If you understand emptiness, that be, because you know it's non inherently existent, but it appeared inherently existent, though, then you know, oh, it's deceptive. It's a false. Do you get it? But if you don't have understanding of emptiness, that things are empty of inherently existing, if you don't, then just by seeing the object, how would you know that it's a deceptive? How do you know that it's a false? You know it's a false. It's deceptive because even though it appeared in a certain way, but it is not how it exists that way. And in order to understand that it does not exist that way, then you have to have to understand the emptiness. And so therefore, in order to, um, it also comes, in order to understand an object that is conventional objects, you don't have to understand that as a conventional truth, okay? When I see the book, 
I'm seeing a conventional phenomena. Okay. When I realize the book, I realize one of conventional objects, but I don't see the book as a conventional truth because I don't have understanding of empty, emptiness of this book. So there is difference, two difference. So I think here again, you know, uh, Amazon Kawa trying to make uh, a, a subtle difference in, in that. Mm. Mm. So I think, yeah, maybe that is, those are the main kind of main point here in two, in two lines, um, C and D, you know, and in the D it give the examples, you know, something like illusion, like appearance, you know, all phenomena are like illusion and appearance. Okay. The book is like illusion, like appearance. Okay. Do you get it? All phenomena are like illusion, like appearance, um, including the book. Okay, so when I see the book or when I, when I apprehend or my mind or I apprehend the book, I'm apprehending one of the object that is like illusion, like appearance. But that doesn't necessarily mean I'm actually uh, recognizing the book as a illusions, like a illusions. And so that by giving that example, the Lama Tsong Kaba making the, um, the other example, here he give the part, but it can be book, it can be computer, you know, when you, when we, when we see the computer or the book, we see one of conventional truth objects, object that is conventional truth. Okay. So when I see the book, when I perceive the book, I perceive one of the conventional uh, phenomena objects conventional reality objects. But that doesn't mean I see the book as a conventional reality or conventional truth itself. Because in order to see that book as a conventional truth, then you have to see that book as a false, as a deceptive. And to be able to understand this book as a deceptive and as a false, then you have to understand is false because it appears inherent existence even though it's non-inherent existence. And for that, therefore, you have to understand non-inherent existence. Um, and therefore, you have to have the understanding of emptiness. So are we clear? The small subtlety, that subtle difference, you know, um, I don't know in, uh, yeah, anyway, I think, um, And then Lama Tsongkhapa kind of refute, you know, um, this idea of in the E, you know, um, idea, you know, that one entity becoming ultimate reality according to the areas and conventional reality according to the ordinary beings, that idea has been refuted um, because it is in that in that sense, it's one entity, but it is a different. It becomes different entity according to different consciousness. But here, here is saying it's that is not the case. Actually, there is two reality, two entity, not just one entity becoming ultimate entity to the area being's mind and becoming a conventional um, reality to the ordinary minds. But actually, there are two different realities or two different entity, and I think um, so. I think maybe I don't know whether uh, I. I think, yeah. Um, and then Lama Tsong Kaba saying, you know, it, actually it. If it's that, it could be even the um, even the the um, other way around. And then now there's come the division of conventionality, the divisions. Um, so in terms of the divisions, um, 
conventional reality, um, there are two different point of view from the Swatantrika Madhyamika and Prasangika Madhyamika. In Swatantrika Madhyamika, then there is um, correct and wrong. I don't know whether how it is translated. Yang Dada, Yang Um Real and wrong. Okay. Um, real and wrong object here. It is translated. Um, correct or real and wrong objects. So wrong conventional. Um, wrong conventional uh, wrong conventional reality and um, real conventional reality okay in according to the uh, sotandrika and even with that in sotandrika they said that a court object when it come to the object because when you think of all the phenomena there is subject and objects the subject that is the consciousness the object, which are the object of the, that consciousness. And in regard to the objects, in regard to the objects, there is real conventional, um, conventional um, truth and wrong conventional truth or reality. When it comes to the consciousness subjects, then they say there is no real and they don't divide real and wrong consciousness, uh, conventional phenomena, only to the objects, not to the subjects. And because they, they say, you know, um, to the subjects, you know, everything's to all the subject, um, you know, um, maybe, maybe, maybe that might be the wrong to say all the subjects, but to the consciousness, you know, um, such as I sense consciousness, such as sense consciousness, the object appears as inherently existent to the, that consciousness. And not only it appears as inherently existing, but they exist actually inherently. Not only there's appearance of inherently existing, but it exists in reality, in um, the mode of existing, it is inherently existence. And so therefore you cannot talk about being deceptive from that point of view. And so therefore, when it comes to consciousness, then they don't divide into wrong and um, real conventional phenomena. But when it took the object, then they divide it because, um, you know, for example, uh, the object such as, let's say, um, you know, the illusions, illusions or the reflections of the moon in the lake, reflection of our face in the uh, mirror, that is the wrong conventional, conventional truth. It is conventional truth and is wrong because, you know, <clears throat> so that is the example of wrong conventional truth, you know, within the objects such as the reflections of the um, the moon in the lake, or our reflections of our face in the mirror. You know, it is conventional phenomena, and um, you know it can be understood as wrong by those, you know, um, those adults who understand it is just a reflection; is not the real face in the mirror who understand is just a reflection of the moon, but it's not real moon. So they can understand it as a wrong. Even those ordinary who have not understood the emptiness, even those who have not understood emptiness, even the ordinary people can understand that as, as something mistaken and wrong. Do you get it? Or the, the illusions created by the magicians. You know, all of that are the objects of, um, so those are the wrong. And whereas the book and the computer itself is a real conventional truth because this 
conventional truth as being wrong, the ordinary being, the ordinary being who have not understood the emptiness cannot understand this computer as being a false. Instead, they see it as a real. Do you get it? They cannot understand or they cannot realize it as a wrong or false. Unlike like the reflections. And so therefore that is that become conventional real, okay? So in terms of dividing, that is that is how. And then prasangika, you know, they don't appreciate, they don't uh, differentiate between being there is a real and wrong conventional phenomena in regard to the object and uh, not real and uh, convention, uh, not real and wrong in regard to the subject, but they, they regard, you know, um, same, they apply both the same object and subject in a similar way. And so, so then they divide, they don't really divide within a conventional phenomena as a uh, wrong and um, real conventional phenomena but they divide according to the um, uh, ordinary people's mind, then there is a conventional uh, phenomenon, one is real and one is wrong, okay? In generally, they don't divide the two types of conventional reality, but they, they divide according to the ordinary point of view. Whereas Prasangika, they divide generally, there is a conventional phenomena real and wrong conventional phenomena objects. Do you, do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? Okay. Prasangika, no Prasangika. So Tandirika, they divide the conventional phenomena in two different kinds of conventional phenomena. You understand that, yeah? Prasangika does not divide two, in general to conventional phenomena because you know whether it is an object whether it is the object or whether it is a subject you know the ordinary being who have not understood emptiness cannot understand them being as a false or as a deceptive because all the objects appear in here in existence and they cannot understand the way it is empty of that inherently existing as it appeared to them. And so therefore they do not divide. But according to ordinary point of view, ordinary um, consciousness, ordinary being consciousness, then you could divide into two. So that is, that is the difference. Um, Here it says, you know, um, this system, so at the very end of 261. Um, well, I think maybe in Sotandesga, maybe, I think maybe that might give a little bit better idea where um, that quotations where they said, this seems the same, but since some can and some cannot fulfill the functioning, distinguish and make between real and unreal conventionality. So from Sotandirika point of view, because the reflections in the, the moon, reflection of moon in the leg cannot function as a moon, okay? Or the reflection of your face in the mirror cannot function as a, a face, therefore is um, wrong or unreal, okay? So is unreal or wrong conventional phenomena. Whereas the face, real face, can function as a face. The moon has functioning of moon, unlike like the reflections. And therefore, that is a real conventional phenomena or conventional reality. So I think that is, maybe that might give a little bit of better idea about how they divide. Um, because the reflection is also conventional phenomena. And, um, you know, so, and so that is how. So then in, in Madhya Mega here, he said, in this system, 
So Madhyamik uh, Prasangika assert that whatever appear to the ignorant acts established by way is own characteristics is appearance of that consciousness polluted by ignorance. So because of pollution imprint of the ignorance, whatever object appear to our consciousness, such as sense consciousness, it appear inherently or truly existence, you know? And so therefore, all the objects are um, unreal or wrong in that way. And so therefore, conventional objects are not distinguished as true, real and wrong, because, you know, they all has appearance of inherently or truly existence, and they all are devoid of truly and inherently existing as it appeared to them. Mm. But they divide for the worldly conventional consciousness. So, so that is where the difference. So they don't divide the conventional truth in the two, but they divide according to the worldly conventional consciousness. Um, and so, you know, someone familiar with the words, something like that, reflection on face is not true face. Um, and hence is not conventional true from that point of view, while it is, this is, is still the object found by consciousness seeing the false object of knowledge and deceive the object. So therefore is the conventional truth. Okay, it is a conventional truth but our consciousness cannot understand is a conventional truth because we don't we don't understand that is uh, the appearance is wrong appearance is false you know consciousness that which reflection appeared to be mistaken about it appearing object likewise those with ignorance whom something blue and light appear to be accepted by its own character mistaken about the appearance object. So I think it is the next one where it comes that why, I, what I was talking about. Hmm? The Prasenka system pulls six consciousness and in fact, a temporary cause of deceptions, you know, so, and six consciousness that are opposite of those, so which are affected by those temporary cause of deceptions and six objects um, that are apprehended by former six consciousness that are unaffected by temporary cause of deceptions and the six objects apprehended by later uh, six, so that are temporarily affected by the cause of deceptions. So those are the wrong object and possessor are possessor wrong conventional, whereas the object and possessor not wrong are possessor real conventional. So, but they are not talking about real and wrong here. So then it says furthermore, it possesses them in a real wrong conventional in relation to the worldly or conventional value cognition rather than in relation to the reason and consciousness that accord with the area visions and other visions. Hmm? So, so uh, again, um, I cannot remember each of those six consciousness that had been temporarily affected, uh, temp affected temporarily. But there are some examples, for example, you know, uh, temporarily affected consciousness, such as, you know, um, due to certain disease, you know, due to certain sickness, disease, there's appearance of um, hair falling down. Even though your hair is not falling down because of some <coughs> disease effect in your disease, so you feel, you see like it's falling down. That consciousness, that see the hair falling down, that is one of the deceptive consciousness, you know? 
And then when someone, you know, uh, what do you call, um, Uh, conception arising from interference, wishing conception, memory conceptions. Um, I think maybe not these are memory conception, wishing conceptions. Um, definitely, those cause of the error may lie in that. Though, based on those. Uh, for so the basis is the way I'm talking about because of some uh, affected in your eye consciousness basis or faculties, and then you have that kind of um, you see that in terms of the um, about you know like when you are in the train car or um, or boat you know then you see even though as though the other things are moving, you know, the house is moving, you know, the trees are moving, even though they are not moving. And that is because the deceptions is in the, of the, the about the place because of the, that you are moving in the car or you are moving those, so you, your eye consciousness see as the others are moving. And then in terms of the objects, you know, then um, for example, when you have this, um, Incense, you know, if you, if you, what do you call, circle it very quickly, then it seems like it's a round something, you know. So in the object, there is a deception again, you know, because again, uh, because of the objects. And sometimes you see like, you know, when, um, when you circle, I don't know, you know, in, in, when we were young, we used to play in the eyes or sometimes you circle like something, you know, what do you call, Sparklers? No, you like turning the wheel, like, you know. A top. Yeah. A top. A top. And when you go, it goes so fast, it's, it's, it seems like it's, even though it's moving so fast, it doesn't seem like it's moving. Do you see it? To, if you see it, it seems like it's not moving, it's just standing there, but it is moving, it's circling, but very, very fast. So it, it seems like it's standing there, you know, so that is again another deception because in the objects. And then immediate perception conditions, you know, um, you know, um, yeah. Um, what was that? Um, Stephen, you know, you, you um, well, well, the example that I know, I guess you share up and thanks for calling on me is uh, when you're angry, mm -hmm. you see everything looks red. Yeah, that is the that preceding one. condition is uh, a state of anger. And so the result is things looking red. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was thinking that could go in the mental mental as well, but it could be that too is preceding. You know, when you have angry, then it, it, you know, like there is kind of appearance of almost like blood, you know, kind of red things, you know, so that is because there is some deception in your mind. So those are the some of the that I can um, remember or I can see, but I, I don't remember. So those consciousness, those consciousness and the object of those consciousness are conventionally un, uh, unreal according in relation to not by itself but in relation to conventional violent cognitions okay in relation to that and then other object other sense consciousness that are not deceived or affected by that and the object of those sense cons the sixth consciousness are the um, the conventional, real conventional um, phenomena or reality, even that, again, only in relation to conventional consciousness, violent cognitions, you know, only in relation to that. So we have to understand that. Um, because whether it's the effective consciousness, whether it's unaffected consciousness, whether it's object of 
object of a conventional uh, effective consciousness or unaffected consciousness, all of them, you know, appear in hidden existence to the consciousness, the sense consciousness. All of them appear to their conscious, um, conscious, uh, inherently or truly exist uh, consciousness, and um, that cannot be understood as a false or untrue or unreal by the conventional reality, not conventional valid cognizers. And so therefore, um, and so therefore all of them cannot distinguish according to that. Mm. So it only from the worldly perspective. So that is where it also says, you know, so in Prasangika point of view, they, they, they divide those real and unreal conventional truth only from the worldly perceptions, only from the worldly perceptions. And so, whereas Sotantrika, they don't divide from the only worldly perception, but they actually divide in generally to to uh, uh, conventional reality. So that is the difference. Mm -hmm. So then there is in the, yeah, it says consciousness need not be mistaken, even though it has dualistic appearance. And moreover, all the dualistic appearance occur to exalted wisdom, knowing the verity, free from all the cause of pollutions and dispositions of ignorance, is not mistaken with regard to its appearance object. The reason I explain elsewhere. So I think this, this subject, I think will also come later when, uh, when Lama Tsongkhapa explained about the, uh, uh, the Buddha's consciousness that apprehends the reality, uh, ultimate truth. So he will also explain a little bit further on that. But basically what he's saying is, you know, even the Buddha's mind has a dualistic appearance. So now it might be very kind of, <laughs> it might be shocking for us, you know, as he said, even though someone who has overcome all the ignorance, all the predispositions of the ignorance, so all the obscurations, even someone who has abandoned, or even they can have a dualistic appearance. And so uh, that might sound a little bit shocking to us because we think that, you know, we are trying to overcome the dualistic view and to achieve the enlightenment that's free from all the dualistic. Uh, um, so here, I think again, um, Lama Tsongkhap already explained in other, other, um, his other writings, but also he will come a little bit later as well when he discussed about the um, Buddha's mind that perceived the conventional reality and ultimate realities. And when it comes to that, um, you know, um, but here, even the Buddha has dualistic appearance, but the way dualistic appearance happened to us and to him is very different. You know, to us, we have the dualistic appearance because of the imprint and predispositions of our ignorance and our obscurations. In Buddha's case, it's not because of that ignorance, not because of um, the obscuration from his side, but because, for example, he know everything. Omniscient, Buddha's mind is omniscient mind. So he had to know everything. So therefore, to my mind, there is a dualistic mind. To my mind, there is dualistic appearance. Okay? There is dualistic appearance to my mind. That has been perceived by the Buddha. Buddha has to know my dualistic appearance. Okay? If he doesn't know my dualistic appearance, he's not omniscient. There's something he doesn't know. And so he know my dualistic appearance. And when it, when the Buddhas, the enlightened beings, when the mind, then uh, when they perceive or when they understand the objects, then they know directly, not, not 
directly. Because it's directly, then it, the object has to appear. So my dualistic appearance appear to the Buddha. Through that, how that is how he, he know my dualistic appearance. And that is why to Buddha, there is an appearance of dualistic, but the way it is have a dualistic appearance is very different from the way we have dualistic view. Are we clear that? So here, that is where this, this um, make, and it, it comes because it is, I don't know it is, it, whether it is very um, extremely beneficial or not, but in terms of, you know, uh, like a philosophy, this is one of his big discussions, you know, whether, whether Buddha is omniscient or not. If he's omniscient, then does he have to dualistic appearance or not? Uh, because if he doesn't, what about my dualistic appearance? Does he know? Does he know my dualistic appearance or not? If he know my dualistic appearance, does my dualistic appearance appear to his mind or not? You know, um, because if he know, he has to know directly. If he know directly, then it has to appear, the object has to appear. And so then how can he be a Buddha if he has a dualistic appearance, you know? So this is kind of point of um, uh, discussion. So I think maybe that is why Lama Tsongkhaba also kind of making some comment on here uh, on that. Um, so then it comes to the ultimate truth. Okay, so ultimate truth. Um, again, it has three um, main outlines, you know. Um, and uh, as it is in clear words by the Chandagiri, you know, why is called ultimate uh, truth? Because it's object and it's ultimate. <laughs> it's called ultimate. <laughs> so it seems like, why is it called, uh, you know, computer? Because it's come and it's pewter. <laughs> Sometimes it seems a little bit like that, but it's because it's object and because it's ultimate. Therefore, it's ultimate objects. Since it's true, it's ultimate. But here, that is where, since it's true, so that is ultimate objects. True object, um, <coughs> yeah, ultimate objects. Um, and again, it is ultimate objects um, because the appearance the, and uh, the way the mode of appear the appearance the mode of existence the way the object exists and the way it appears to the mind that apprehend directly there is no disparity and so therefore it's truth therefore it's ultimate therefore that object is uh, true object ultimate objects okay and so that is how we know but something i think maybe it might come down but something with ultimate object doesn't exist ultimately. We have to differentiate these two things. Nothing exists ultimately. Even the emptiness does not exist ultimately. But it's the ultimate objects. So that is, again, uh, subtle differences. I think it will a little bit come later as well. You know, there's a difference between what ultimate truth or ultimate object means and what it means ultimately existence. And there is a difference between what is conventional truth and what it means to exist conventionally. Okay? Not all the objects are conventional truth, but all objects or phenomena exist conventionally. Even the, even the ultimate truth exists conventionally, it does not exist ultimately. If it exists ultimately, then it exists truly, inherently. So emptiness, emptiness itself cannot be inherent existence. It is non-inherent existence. So I think, um, again, I think those are certain, certain subtleties or difference that we have to understand. Um, because sometimes the moment you see, oh, it's ultimate object, then we think it is ultimately existence. You know? 
and sometimes even in the past, some of the uh, you know practitioner has some sometimes been mistaken for that, grasping and holding and believing that emptiness because it's ultimate truth. Therefore, it must exist ultimately, you know, and and so. Mm. And also, we have to understand. Same term can be used very differently according to different contexts. That is, you see in Buddhist, especially in the Buddhist writing, same term is used for so many different things in different contexts. Sometimes ultimate truth can apply to the, the wisdom that relies emptiness itself. And sometimes it is to the, uh, the object, the emptiness itself. So here, of course, it is referring to the object, the emptiness. But sometimes in certain tantric um, writings and some others, you can also see sometimes also the wisdom realizing the emptiness can be also used uh, term as ultimate truth. You know, sometimes it can be also. So we have to understand in the context sometimes that too. So, so why it is ultimate truth? So then here it says, you know, True is because it's no non-deception, deceptiveness, because it's not deceptiveness. It's true because it's not. So we have to understand here when we say con ultimate truth and conventional truth. Both of them has truth. But the meaning of truth is very different. When you apply to what it means truth in ultimate sense and what it means truth in conventional reality, because we already discussed about a conventional reality, why it is in that word, why it is truth, because it's true to the ignorance. We talk about that. Here, um, we are talking about the, uh, here true is because the object is undeceptive because the way it exists and the way it appears to the mind that precede it, there's no deception in that appearance and the way it exists. And so therefore it's truth, you know. It does not deceive the world, abide in one way, the way it exists and appearing in a different way because the way it exists is, is non-inherent existence. The is empty of inherent existence, is non-inherent existence, and to the mind that perceives it directly, to the Arya mind that perceives it directly, it also appears non-inherent existence. It also appears non-inherent existence. And so therefore it doesn't um, deceive. Mm. And then it says, you know, here it says that ultimate truth is merely posited, existing by the power of worldly convictions. So again, when you see, then again, that is where I already said, you know, ultimate existence or the ultimate truth, the em emptiness, to establish its existence, the mind that ex established the emptiness as an existence is conventional, conventional mind, not ultimate mind. Do you get it? Any phenomena that is established as an existence, the mind that establishes something as existence is a conventional consciousness, conventional phenomena. And so that is where even the ultimate truth to establish as the, it is an existence, is a conventional uh, mind, um, not the reasoning mind, the wisdom reasoning mind, okay? The, wis uh, the wisdom reasoning mind relies or understands the emptiness, but it does not establish emptiness as the existence. The mind which establishes it as an existence and conventional um, consciousness. So again, those are again, uh, kind of subtle, you know, subtle, um, um, yeah. So yeah, here it is also the truth and conventional truth and uh, the truth in the ultimate truth, it has not same meaning. It's a different meaning, as I mentioned already. You know, um, it is it it uh, because in conventional phenomena, 
if we apply the same meaning here, then it will be conventional phenomena is truth because uh, the way it exists and the way it appears is there's not no disparity. But it can't be that because there is a disparity. In conventional phenomena, the way it exists and the way it appears to the consciousness that perceive it directly, there's a disparity. Therefore, it can, therefore you cannot explain truth the way you explain to the ultimate truth. So it's a different, even though we use the same word truth, the meaning of truth in conventional uh, truth and the meaning of truth in ultimate uh, truth, it has a different. And so I think um, that is where the point is making. Uh -huh. Then the, the actual definitions. Um, Yeah, basically, uh, the, the definition is in ultimate truth is the object that is being perceived or that is being found by the exalted wisdom, uh, the reasoning wisdom of the exalted wisdom. Or uh, so, yeah. Mm. So I think we we kind of. So it is, is the objects that is found by uncontaminated exalted wisdom, you know, and that apprehend the emptiness or suchness. Um, and which is not to be established by its own entity or by its own uh, um, yeah, uh, inherent existence, you know. Mm. So again, uh, it explained about, you know, different between the kind of exalted wisdom and general exalted wisdom area. And then um, when you say it's an object of exalted wisdom, we are speaking about specific exalted wisdom because this specific exalted wisdom is the wisdom that knows the mode of existence. And so that particular exalted wisdom because Arya can have many exalted wisdom, but not all the, those exalted wisdom are, um, knows the mode of existence. So here, when you use uh, object of comprehension or understanding of exalted wisdom, we are referring to this particular exalted wisdom that knows the, uh, the, uh, the mode of existence. So that has been kind of clarified a little bit. Mm. And then next one, you know, in this uh, uh, is explained, you know, again here about that same, when you have defect in your eye faculties, and then we give an example, then there you see the uh, falling of the hair, you know, but someone who doesn't have that defect, they don't have even that appearance, okay? Sometimes you can have appearance and you don't know that you are mistaken, and sometimes your appearance, you know, is mistaken. You know, um, for example, like for example, maybe more than the eye. Let's say we, when you are moving in the car, you see the house moving, but you know it is not really moving. Is you your car you moving or your car is moving? Isn't it? There's the appearance, but we don't believe that appearance. Someone who doesn't know, maybe they might believe, oh, the house are moving. You know, it could be possible for someone who doesn't know that they might get confused and they, they might think, oh, how come the house are moving? And for most of people, they are aware, even though there's appearance, but they know it is um, it's not moving. So they know it's wrong. Then someone who is not actually in the car, then they don't even have the dead appearance of moving. Yeah, they don't even have that appearance. And so in the same way, you know, 
um, for the ordinary being who have not understood the emptiness, there is appearance of inherent existence and they believe in hidden existence. And then there are those who have understood emptiness, but who have not understood emptiness directly. Okay, who have not understood emptiness directly. For them, there is appearance of inherent existence of the object, but they don't believe that appearance because they know is empty of truly existence, even though there is appearance of that. Then the Aryas who are in, who have direct realization of emptiness and who are in deep meditative eco voice, in that moment, there is not even the appearance. There is not even the appearance of any dualistic view. So when you talk about dualistic view, there are many, many uh, uh, level of dualistic. One level is appearance of truly existence. Okay, that is dualistic view. The object appearing as truly existence. And then there is a appearance of subject and object. You know, the subjects that is meditating, the object that is being meditated, subject and object. That is on another level of dualistic view. And then sometimes even there is not even the object, uh, appearance of object and subject, but there is appearance of conventional phenomena. That is also delusive view. The appearance of conventional phenomena. For, for example, when you are in deep meditative equipoise, you are meditating on separateness of persons. The appearance of the person itself is a dualistic. So in that meditative equipoise, there is no appearance of inherent existence. There is no appearance of subjects and objects. And there is no appearance of even the object, the conventional phenomena objects. And so all the dualistic uh, appearance disappear in that moment. All the dualistic um, appear, only thing that appear is emptiness in that meditative ego voice mind. Only thing that appear is the emptiness, nothing. It doesn't appear even the object of that emptiness. If you are meditating on emptiness of the book, there is appearance of the emptiness, but there is no appearance of the book itself. There is only appearance of emptiness of the book, but not the book. The moment there is appearance of the book, then it becomes also dualistic view. And so in that way, mm. So that is where uncontaminated exalted wisdom, when we talk about the objects of the uncontaminated exalted wisdom, that is the, that med, the exalted wisdom area in that method of equipoise that is free from all this dualistic view. So that kind of particular exalted wisdom. Um, So the nature perceived through this mode of perception is ultimate truth. So that is where it says, you know, so, and then of course, as a, as a um, reference um, sources, then the middle way commentary, it also says that, and as well as the commentary, you know, of that. Mm. And so next discussion is whether nirvana is ultimate truth or conventional truth, you know. Um, and there is, again, that is another uh, object of discussions, um, whether nirvana is uh, ultimate truth or conventional truth, you know. Um, mm. So ultimate truth, you know, um, has two. When we talk nirvana, there are two types of nirvana. So here he's talking about nirvana, two types of nirvana. One is naturally pure nirvana. And that means, you know, for example, uh, your mind, the nature of your mind being empty or inherent existence. Okay. The nature of your mind being inherent existence. So when you, when we achieve 
nirvana, when you achieve nirvana, when our mind is free from all the afflictive emotion, all the delusion, that is when you achieve the nirvana. And when you achieve that nirvana, your, um, that mind that is free from all the delusions, all the afflictive emotions, that mind is the nature of that mind is empty of truly existence. And that one is naturally pure nirvana. The nature of that mind has been always same. Our nature of our mind and nature when we achieve enlightenment, same in that, that, that nature. That nature that is empty of truly existence. Okay. The other is, um, the other one is that uh, that is free from all the different seed of defilements, you know, so all the afflictive emotions. So when your mind is free from all the afflictive emotions, then you achieve cessations, free from all the delusions, afflictive emotions, you know, and that, that is called nirvana, which is true cessations. We call gokten. Um, and that is um, the nirvana, um, which is true cessations, which means that is free from the mind, which is free from all the defilement, all the delusions. And so there are two types of nirvana. So we talk naturally pure nirvana and uh, nirvana, that is true cessations. Okay. And so first identifying what is a nirvana before we talk about whether nirvana is um, Nirvana belong to which truth, you know? And so, mm. so then you, you see, you know, in many, many, some of the um, scriptures, you know, um, like 60 stanza of reasoning by Nagarjuna, a commentary to that, you know, it seems to indicate Nirvana is conventional truth. Where they say Nirvana also conventional truth, therefore Nirvana is only designated as conventional truth. But actually, nirvana is the ultimate truth. And so ult nirvana is ultimate truth. And so if ult nirvana is ultimate truth, so how come in many of those, um, many of the writing of Nagarjuna uh, and others' commentaries, they seem to indicate some they are conventional truth. And so then Lama Tsongkhapa kind of explaining the meaning of those um, you know, you can't take those statements literally, you know. If you take those statements literally, then they will have a contradiction because it, within the same commentaries, again, within the same commentary, it says, again, it is the ultimate truth. The three first amount of uh, four noble truth, first three are the conventional uh, truth, and uh, the last one, nirvana, or the cessations, um, uh, the other one is the uh, uh, ultimate truth. So how can it, some, even within the one commentary, you find two different, um, seems like contradictory kind. So therefore you can't take both of them literally. And therefore, if you don't take literally, then what does that mean? So then Lama Tsongkhapa will give uh, more explanation on that. Uh, I don't know whether I have to read it, but, um, yeah, uh, because what it means, as it says, you know, um, it means, you know, that the nirvana being existence, as I already mentioned before, even though nirvana is ultimate truth, but nirvana establishing as an existence is by conventional uh, um, by the cognizers or conventional uh, um, uh, consciousness. So it is the nirvana is been established as an existence by conventional truth, which is the conventional uh, consciousness. So that is what it means. It doesn't mean actually uh, the, the nirvana itself is, is a conventional truth. And so it, that is where it says, you know, the same comment it also explained that three truth are conventional truth and that nirvana is ultimate truth. So therefore it can't be contradictions, you know, it can't be. So there is, you have to understand that. So that is, um, and then again, it is, I think same thing down the source for that um, in the sutras. Um,
I think I'm going to kind of stop here today. Um, yeah. So if there is any questions, I can take one questions. Otherwise, you can do during the discussions. And uh, I think I'm not going to read each of them because I'm trying to complete within, um, I think maybe probably we have maybe more four, uh, six or maybe six more sessions to complete all of them. Um, so if if I keep on going to the each of the, all of that, then I don't think we can complete that. So um, I think I just try to go some of the, point uh, that I, I feel that might be um, helpful, you know, or yeah, on the basis of that. Okay. See, Stephen raised his hand. Yes, please. Thank you, Geshe-la. Okay. So th this is my question. Um, when an Arya being is in meditative equipoise, mm -hmm directly perceiving emptiness. Uh, well, I'm a little bit confused. So I, th I think I know that emptiness doesn't exist by itself. It's always emptiness of something, of an object. So mm -hmm. a book is a good example. So you have a book and emptiness of the book. When the Arya being is meditating on emptiness, how can they then be just meditating on pure emptiness or do, do they know that it's the emptiness of the book without knowing the book because that is a conventionality? No, you know, for, for example, when we start, just to give an example, when you start doing the em, uh, emptiness of self or the book, you started to do the analysis, you know, to start with, whether the book is this and this or whether this and that, all the reasoning and, or, and exam through that kind of examination analysis then you come to the conclusion that it is empty of truly existence yeah. once you come to that truly then you, you don't think about the book you just are in the state that it is empty of truly existing you have already done the analysis at the very beginning but once you have that conclusion and you are in that deep meditation or meditative equipoise then you are in just state that is empty of inherent existence but at the very beginning of course you meditate on whatever objects to really go into that. But once you come to that understanding or emptiness of that object, then you are deep in that emptiness that is empty of um, inherent existence. That's all that appear to that mind, that object. Okay. Does that make sense? I'll have to think about that. Your, your answer, you know, I could follow your answer, but I'm still a little bit confused as how it can just be pure emptiness without some perception that it has a particular basis, even though you might not have. Um, we are talking about to the, the appearance to the mind. We are not talking about the object, the, the emptiness or object itself. We are talking about the appearance to that mind right. where all the dualistic mind disappear. But of course, there cannot be an emptiness of book without a book. I guess, I guess my question then becomes, if, if I may continue, um, yeah. my, my question becomes, so if, if then once, you know, uh, an Arya being is meditating on emptiness, they just perceive pure emptiness. So how is it different from the different levels of Arya beings from the path of seeing all the way through to the pure grounds, how does the emptiness differ in terms of the afflictions that it removes? For example, on the path of seeing so the acquired knowledge afflictions mm -hmm. or, the, or, the high, or the pure grounds, the, the knowledge obscuration. So if, is it the same emptiness that is uh, pacifying or subduing or ceasing those afflictions? No, the, we want to say it's the same emptiness, but we will say it's the wisdom that relies on emptiness that has been more and more refined and more and more stronger. Uh, okay. you know? 
that makes sense, yeah. So it's the wisdom that relies on emptiness. As you meditate more and more, it becomes more and more refined, more and more powerful, more and more stronger as you go with. And then that become more powerful to destroy a more subtle level of more subtle level of the okay. uh, delusions. Okay. And so it's the emptiness is the same, yet the, the consciousness has become more refined. Yeah, more powerful. Yeah. It has removed those other layers prior. Mm -hmm. Yes. At, uh, say at the pure grounds. Okay. Thank you very much, Keshela. Okay, thank you. So we do the dedications. Yawadi nyo do da la ma sang ye do kyo ne do a ji gya ma le ba te sa la pe ba sho. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhisattva that has not arisen, arise and grow, and may that which has arisen and not diminish but increase more and more. Jigden kam de pende malu pa kang le chung we sambe yi shin no kardin chung me ten zin jya so la so wa de so tu je lun du shou. You who uphold the subdue moral way, who serve as a bountiful bearer of all sustaining, preserving, spread and mention of victory doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayer, holding the three jewels, severe of myself and other your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you, oh, venerable one, to you whose kindly exists, that of all conquered for those who wander in the far places, especially the West, mindful of your love and concern for us, in intention and descending again, in the family of our distant land, we make this request, O oh, Lama, please, please live long. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gershwar. So, 